Well, welcome everyone and uh, welcome to CASM's second town hall. This one is highlighting careers in sports medicine and we're excited to have you all. Bonsoir tout le monde. I'm Dr. Kathy Campbell. I'm the president-elect of CASM for 2122. And a couple of housekeeping things, just remember to mute your microphones and uh, put any of your questions in the chat and we will address them at the end. So thanks again for joining us. Going to the next slide, Don, our agenda briefly, you'll see. And uh, besides uh, a welcome and uh, land acknowledgement, uh, we're gonna talk briefly about uh, CASM and sports medicine. We're going to uh, um, tell you about our national strategy, which is very exciting. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then we're going to um, uh, introduce you to our wonderful three uh, physicians in sports medicine that are gonna tell you about their careers. Uh, so next slide. I wanna start with the land acknowledgement and uh, we acknowledge that the lands on which we are hosting this meeting include the tra traditional territories of many nations. CASM recognizes that many injustice, injustices experienced by the indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well being. CASM respects that indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite us all to reflect on territories you are calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship and contributing to reconciliation. So thank you and uh, welcome everyone. So CASM started, um, was born, if you will, June 8th, 1970 in Ottawa. And it, the initial name was CASM, C-A-S-M, uh, which stood for Canadian Academy of Sport Medicine. So CASM was developed because of specific medical problems presented at the 68 Olympics in Mexico City. And you can only imagine some of the health problems that came up at altitude with heat and, and various circumstances. And, um, a lot of problems uh, came up at that time. And so CASM was developed by some legends in sports medicine many years ago that many of them are still highly involved in, uh, in CASM. And uh, since that time, uh, we've really evolved from taking care of uh, elite uh, athletes to really becoming uh, a leading source of information and expertise in the art and science of sports medicine. When it reached the age of 40, which was in June, 2010, CASM changed its name to include exercise. So it's Canadian Academy of Sport and Exercise Medicine, which really reflects more the practice uh, profile of sports medicine physicians. We're much more involved uh, now in exercise prescription, in the movement is medicine. Um, and these uh, certainly are, uh, are our mantra these days. Uh, it is a physician only organization and it is multidisciplinary, uh, but we do have close ties to other health alliances and welcome uh, them to all of our meetings. We have lots of physios, chiros, massage, osteos that, that do come to our meetings and others as well. We do have a diploma in sport and exercise medicine and it's 20 stations. It can, they're OSCEs, and it can be taken at the end of your sports medicine fellowship or after two years of independent practice. In 2022, we will be holding two exams, a bilingual exam in the spring in Ottawa and an English one in Calgary. And we actually just had our first CHASM uh, exam in person after this pandemic. So it's been a while. Uh, 20 months or so, um, and we hosted that in Ottawa last month, uh, which was a great success, and everyone was very excited to be back. Uh, the CASM exam is usually held annually every spring. The exam is offered in English every year and in French every second or fourth year, depending on demand. And if any of you uh, 
uh, out there, and I know we have a lot of medical students and residents and fellows out there. If any of you would like to be standardized patients in uh, future exams, certainly let us know. And I do direct you to our CASM website, which is excellent, has lots of information. And uh, Don, who's going to speak uh, next, uh, is our executive director and is a wealth of information and has led us for many, many years. So on the next slide, you'll see um, something we're very proud of, which is our CASM National Education Strategy. And this really relates to all of you because we're looking for your help. Uh, and I'm gonna hand this over to Dawn to uh, speak more about this. So I'll be brief, but this is a new strategy that CASM launched um, this year. We're very excited about it. It's really looking at the role physical activity plays in health overall. And the biggest, uh, we wanna start from grassroots. We wanna start um, at the beginning, and uh, that's something you can play a role in as well as a medical student. Our uh, aim in our first phase of this um, national strategy is to make sure you as medical students have the training that you need um, and the education in your curriculum that you need to, um, to benefit from um, you know, the, 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 the role that activity plays in the management of um, in the, and the, the benefits to, to, to health and the role it plays in, 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 in mitigating those um, uh, health risks in um, chronic disease. So that is our first initiative. We are, as a, as a committee, working on, um, with individual medical schools, we have identified physician champions in each medical school. If that is something that you are interested in, please contact me. Um, it will be uh, phased within uh, medical school, medical uh, school curriculum first. Then we're going to look at postgraduate um, curriculum, and then um, one of the roles that Chasm's played over the many uh, years is looking at the role of medicine through movement and um, educating our own physicians as well across Canada. So that's a big initiative. It's a big chunk of work, and uh, just keep um, your eyes and ears on as we move ahead with that initiative. And as I said, if any of you out there want to get involved, please contact me. Thanks. So I am from Halifax, Nova Scotia. I started off with a phys ed degree. Many of you are coming from different uh, places, different degrees, uh, different interests. Uh, after a phys ed degree, I did a master's in exercise physiology. I uh, was a track coach. And I did that for many years. And my first job was with the Coaching Association of Canada. And uh, after that, I found myself in medicine. And after that, of course, I ended up back in sport. And what the medical students especially should think of out there and the residents is that medicine is a great career, but it's long, tough years and hard, hard work and uh, enjoyable work, but uh, you wanna make sure that you enjoy what you're doing because you're gonna be spending a whole lot of hours doing it. And you wanna have some fun during the time as well. So, so that's what this has been for me. Uh, I ended up with the national soccer team for 13 years. And this was actually my last journey with them at the end of 13 years and after more than 50 trips and all the ups and downs and several coaches and so forth. And this was the London Olympics where we won a bronze medal in uh, 2012. Uh, it was the first medal that Canada had won since uh, 1928 in a summer team sport, just saying. Uh, so it was uh, pretty exciting. And uh, if you look there, you'll see Herdman, John Herdman, who's now coaching the men's team to great success as well. So, uh, so lots of fun. And speaking of fun, if you go to the next slide, yes, we don't work all the time. There's lots of stories within all of uh, these slides, of course. I did uh, have the opportunity to work at uh, 15 World Cups and uh, they all were different. They all had lots of travel. Uh, spent six weeks in Azerbaijan. Uh, it took me six weeks to learn to say Azerbaijan. And uh, so uh, all of these represent, uh, many of them are from the London Olympics, especially the big moose there from uh, uh, the Canadian moose uh, that we carry to all of our Olympics. Um, 
riding camels in Jordan after a Jordan World Cup and so forth. So lots of fun and um, uh, great opportunities within sport for travel and for, um, for, of course, working with teams and sport and so forth. Um, I'm next going to introduce our first uh, speaker tonight, and that is Dr. Lindsay Bradley. And I'm delighted to uh, introduce Lindsay. She practices primary care sports medicine at Carleton University. She is the program director for the PGY3 Enhanced Skills in Sport and Exercise Medicine at the University of Ottawa. She's the chair of the Postgraduate Education Committee at CASM. And she has worked with various Paralympic national teams, including men's sledge hockey, para swimming, and is currently the team physician for men's, oops, go back, men's and women's goalball. Uh, a fun fact, uh, through her work with Invictus uh, in 2017, you may uh, recognize a couple of characters that she has her arms around, or they have her arms around her, uh, she certainly uh, gets to rub shoulders with uh, some royalty there. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Lindsay to tell us a little bit about her career and, and uh, how she got there. Thanks, Kathy. Um, so I'm just gonna get my slides up here. Okay, hopefully you guys can all see that okay. Um, so I'm going to start off the presentation talking a little bit about a career in sport medicine, kind of following along with what Kathy started, but I'm going to focus on um, the path through uh, a PGY3 um, in sport and exercise medicine from the family medicine route. So, I mean, we've talked a little bit about this, but just kind of a bit of background, what exactly is sport and exercise medicine? And so it's really the practice of medicine as it applies to kind of all aspects of physical activity, including health promotion and disease prevention. So it's not just about the elite athletes, it's everything from, you know, just trying to keep people active in general, um, you know, from, from all levels of, of activity and then providing care for them if they do have uh, an injury. So lots of elements of that, um, you know, so you can see that here on this slide of all the different aspects of sport and exercise medicine. Um, and then as well as other, other things. So we're involved in, in research, in education, in advocacy um, at different levels um, of, you know, government and policy and other different things like that. So lots of different ways that you can tailor a career in sport and exercise medicine. Um, sport and exercise medicine physicians can be uh, family physicians, so can come from a, a residency in family medicine, can be orthopedics, can be physiatry, can be pediatrics. So again, lots of different avenues that you can get to that route from, from medical school. And um, we'll hear about kind of the specialty route a little bit later, and I'm going to focus mostly on the, the family medicine aspect. So for those of you that are um, in medical school um, and some of you that are that are in residency, if you're in a family medicine residency, uh, this is one route that we get to be a sport medicine doctor is we do a third year uh, enhanced skills in family medicine called sport and exercise medicine. Uh, and there are currently uh, 13 programs across, uh, across the country, and that equates to about 19 or 20 positions because some programs will have, will have two spots or three spots even in certain years. So you can see there on the, on the left-hand side all the different schools that, um, that offer a, currently a, a sport medicine uh, PGY3 year. Um, all of them have similar curriculums that are governed by the Canadian College of Family Physicians, so the CFPC, um, that give us the priority topics and key features of what we need to teach. But then within that, each program has some variation in what they would like to 
uh, to teach and what they'd like to focus on. And some, you know, cities will have different access to different things. So you get to know a little bit about the programs to decide, you know, what might be a better, a better fit for you when you're applying. Um, and all of the programs will prepare you to get a certificate of added competence in sport and exercise medicine from the College of Family Physicians. And they will all prepare you to take the diploma exam from CASM um, that we talked about with John and Kathy earlier. So just as an example, this is a sample program that we have at the University of Ottawa. And again, like I said, they're all a little bit different, but just to give you an idea of what one program looks like so that you can kind of see what it is. So it's one year or, or 13 blocks um, as you um, have in your, in your other residency programs. Um, and at, at the University of Ottawa, uh, we do um, six blocks of primary care sport medicine. So, you know, a little over six months of that. And that's spread over the course of five different clinics. So you get to see two university clinics, University of Ottawa and Carleton University, and then a number of other community clinics spread across the city. So you get different exposures and different teachers. We do orthopedics and pediatric orthopedics. We do plastic surgery and radiology. We do some rheumatology and physiatry, and then we do some exercise medicine like cardiac rehab and rest rehab, which gives you a little bit of a flavor of some of the specialty um, areas that we deal with in sport and exercise medicine, as well as some of the people that we collaborate with in, in consultation and such. Um, we still do some half days in family medicine, so you keep up your skills in that. Uh, we do have a longitudinal clinic where you get to follow your own sport medicine patients. Um, we have academic days with didactic teaching as well as an ultrasound curriculum for MSK ultrasound. Um, we have lots of residents that will teach medical students and teach family medicine residents. Uh, we have community rounds, journal club, um, a scholarly project, access to our anatomy lab, um, and you'll get many, many more than your 50 hours required for your CASM, uh, to sit your CASM diploma. So our residents are the primary physician for uh, two varsity teams, one in the fall and one in the winter, where they get to really get their um, get in there and, and get to get the exposure of not just shadowing somebody, but really being the team physician for a team, um, which they really, really appreciate. So just a little bit about kind of my journey, sort of similar to Kathy gave you a little bit of review of hers. Um, so I did go through a PGY3 program in, in family medicine. So I was at the University of Ottawa and I did my family medicine residency there. And then I went on to do a third year in sport and exercise medicine after that. Um, my day-to-day -day job is I work at Carleton University. So the other university uh, in the city at the sport medicine clinic there. Um, and I work with um, our sort of varsity teams and my main teams are women's rugby and women's basketball at the university, um, but we all sort of share and cross cover when, when we need to. Um, some of the other local teams in the city, so the Ottawa 67s, which is our OHL hockey team, and the Ottawa Red Blacks, which is our CFL team, so I'm part of the, um, the team, sort of the group of physicians that look after uh, those teams. Um, and as Kathy mentioned, I'm currently the team physician for Goalball. Um, through those are kind of my my clinical things and and what I do sort of on a on a day to day basis. Some of the other work um, that I do as well, like we had mentioned, sort of program director, so that education piece, so kind of teaching medical students, family medicine residents, and our and our third year fellows. Um, I work um, as, the, as a rep on the U Sports Medical Committee, so just making sure that all the university uh, sports are following the same medical guidelines, um, have gotten involved with our OMA or Ontario Medical Association um, Sport and Exercise Medicine group, um, so planning um, different conferences and things like that for physicians, sport and exercise medicine physicians and family physicians in the area of, um, of uh, sport medicine. Um, and then uh, as well as CASM. So I, I work with our para and adaptive working group at CASM um, and our sort of post-grad education committee. So you can start to see with all of these different things is that you can get your uh, hand in a whole bunch of different areas. So it's your clinical work, it's your teamwork, it's education work, um, it's you know planning conferences and, and things like that. It's being involved in different advocacy efforts at you know different areas. I have a interest in mental health there as well. So I work with a group called Bench the Barriers, which is 
you know, focusing on um, athlete mental health. So a number of different ways that you can bring sport and exercise medicine into your, into your work. So as I mentioned, some of my main clinical interests are, are, are para and adaptive sport medicine, um, mental health, um, varsity athletics, because that's my day-to-day -day, uh, work, um, student and resident education, um, along with kind of continuing medical education for, for physicians as, as well as for students. My day-to-day -day clinical work has changed over the years as well. And so that's something that's really, really neat about family medicine and sport medicine from that aspect of things is that, you know, every one of us, you'll ask what our day-to-day -day work and our career looks like. And it's all a little bit different. My day looks a little bit different than Kathy's day. It looks a little bit different than Daryl's day or week. Um, and that's changed over the course of our careers as well. So um, right now I, I work in a primary care sport medicine clinic and, and then do some education stuff. When I first started, when I first graduated, I worked a lot in the operating room as an operating room assistant. Um, and then that was something I sort of transitioned out of at one point and, and may go back to again. Um, I did start doing family medicine when I first started. Um, I don't have my own family practice anymore, but still do a lot of family medicine within our um, uh, athlete population as well as athlete families. Um, I do some hospitalist work at our rehab center. So again, bring my sport medicine hat to a different sort of hospital uh, setting. So again, over the years that can mold and that can change, you know, based on if you get a little tired or something or a little bit burnt out about something else, uh, you know, you can move on and, and try something different all within your same area and credentials, which is the really neat thing about the, the family uh, sport medicine route. So as, as Kathy talked about, one of the most fun things that we do is, is being a team physician. And that's what kind of people get into sport medicine for. So we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about it. It's not the, you know, the only thing that we do, but it is one of the, the main things that we do. And when you're working as a team physician, that can be at the varsity level, the national level, professional, semi-professional, even your kid's hockey team, whatever it may be, um, there's lots of different ways that, that you can kind of be part of part of that team. And often when you're part of that team, you become their family doctor as well. So you're not only, you know, stitching up injuries and fixing fractures and assessing things on the field, you're also dealing with coughs and colds and mental health and sexually transmitted infections and prevention and screening for cancer because some of these athletes have not seen a family doctor in a very long time and you are their doctor for many, many years. Um, so that's the really neat thing about being a team physician. It's not just about managing that shoulder injury that that happened um, on the field of play it's all the other stuff that, that comes along with it and with that you get some really neat experiences so you know you get to sometimes be part of the glory of being part of a, a winning team and you get some pretty neat bling sometimes too uh, as being part of that so you know by no means of you know, am I on the ice doing the things that uh, that these athletes are doing, but we're still a big part of that team. And so oftentimes we get rewarded with that and, and we get to be part of that and part of that sort of team and family culture. Uh, so this is the men's national sledge hockey team. They had won gold at the world championships in 2017. So I was lucky enough to be part of that. Um, you have the potential to travel to some really neat places. Um, which is really cool because you can stay before and after and see some great things because you often, you know, during the camp that you're there are working hard so you don't get to see very much of, you get to see the venue and your hotel. Um, but the other interesting thing is you're trying to navigate medical care in other countries. So there are language barriers. They're trying to figure out hospitals in other countries. You're trying to get insurance. Um, you know, to cover uh, things for you, you know, before you have to uh, agree that you're going to get it. Um, and you're the kind of main point of contact for, for health and safety while traveling. So, you know, the team manager might make a plan for something, but they haven't thought about the health and safety or the accessibility if you're working with uh, um, any athletes with impairment. So um, that's your job in that role. So it's not about just getting, getting on the plane and going and having a good time. Um, that's part two, but um, you have to kind of think of that, that whole piece of things when you're, when you're traveling. Uh, and keeping that athlete health and safety at uh, top of mind. But you get really good using Google Translate and uh, things like that when you're trying to navigate the healthcare system in other countries for sure. 
one of the other neat things is if you if you don't if you're not with a specific team and traveling with them, there are opportunities to do sort of multi sport games so things like Invictus or Canada games or obviously the big things like Paralympics and the Olympics but. These are places where um, a number of practitioners come together to look after our own sort of Canadian delegation. So if you want an endless supply of polo shirts and backpacks, you know, sport medicine is for you because, you know, you definitely get all that, that stuff when you go to these events. But the, really the key thing is that um, you make a lot of great friendships and great connections at these multi-sport games because the team is often, is often large. Um, and sometimes you do get to, to meet some interesting people along the way as well. So, you know, the, the Olympics, the Paralympics, that's the thing that people always put on their bucket list. That's what they want to do. It takes a while to get there sometimes. It also takes a little bit of luck sometimes too, being at the right place at the right time, um, you know, paying your dues and that sort of thing. Um, but one of the neat things about this is, you know, for many of us, our athletic careers you know, are, are slowing down or we never got the opportunity to, to get this far, but you've always dreamt of that. You've always dreamt of, you know, walking in an opening ceremonies or winning that gold medal or those types of things. So for many of us, this is a way to, to either relive that again um, or to do that if we never got the opportunity to. And the other big thing is at these events is access to a lot of mentors. So in sport medicine, we have a huge group. Everybody is super collegial. I have learned the most from a lot of, you know, people above me um, uh, and some really, really great mentors along the way. Um, and that's one of those things that these types of games that you get a lot out of, you get a lot, a lot of teaching from, from the people who are more experienced than you. Um, the other thing that I've alluded to a couple of times is that team atmosphere uh, with your medical team. So this is at the Parapan End Games in Lima. We had one of the best medical teams I think I've ever worked with at that games. It was just an excellent group of people, um, everybody working together, pulling together, but also having a ton of fun. We worked hard. We worked long hours because we were a small team for, for a huge number of athletes. Um, but it was really, really, you know, great collegiality. And even though you'd worked a long day, you still stayed up late at night because you didn't want to miss um, hanging out with the rest of the team and, and just sharing stories, whether that be, be personal and or professional sort of learning along the way. So um, that, that team atmosphere with the medical team is huge and you develop really lifelong friendships with a lot of these um, other uh, practitioners along the way, physicians, physiotherapists, athletic therapists, massage therapists, et cetera. Um, and then you start to have all these great people you know in different corners of the country. So people that you can go visit and things like that. As I've mentioned, there's lots of other avenues other than kind of the team physician work in sport medicine. There's education and curriculum. There's obviously conference planning, presentations, continuing professional development. CASM has so many courses that you can either attend or be part of planning. Um, research is another area that's just so up and coming in sport medicine for sure um, that we wanna sort of continue to push. Uh, and so many committees where you can, you know, sit on and be a part of. So CASM has a bunch of committees uh, that we are actively looking for students and residents to be part of uh, many of those. Um, your provincial sport medicine association. So Ontario Medical Association has a sport medicine body. Alberta does. Quebec does as well. So being part of those groups. Um, being a medical consultant for certain things. So youth sports or local teams or professional teams. But um, when you're starting out, it, you know, it could be something as simple as being the health and safety rep for the local, um, you know, minor bantam hockey team, those types of things is ways that you can get in. And then other big sport organizations like the Canadian Paralympic Committee or the Canadian Olympic Committee. So, so many opportunities in sport medicine in all different avenues for whatever you might have interest in. And my last I want to talk about is the sport medicine community, just our group of physicians. So we are growing, Chasm is getting bigger and bigger, but for whatever reason, we still feel like a family, a really small group, even though there's so many of us. Um, so we have tons of fun at conferences and events, and you meet, like I said, lots and lots of people and make lifelong friendships, and we have a really, really great time. And so despite the fact that it's a really big group, it's also a really collegial group um, that we uh, that we really uh, enjoy each other's company and have great times when we get together. 
I think we're going to leave questions uh, to the end, but uh, thank you for, for listening about my journey and as well how to, how to get there through the family medicine route. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Lindsay. That was great. And, you know, it, you really speak to, um, you know, of all the medical specialties. I think collegiality, I have to say, in sports medicine is, is just so great and uh, in sport and exercise medicine. Also, just as a shout out to the medical students and uh, residents and fellows uh, that we do have committees, as Lindsay said, you can look on our website, uh, you can see which committees we're, we're looking for people. Um, our membership has grown. We actually cracked a thousand this year for the first time. So we're over a thousand members and uh, we're looking for you. So, uh, so great. I'm going to introduce now uh, Daryl Menard. And Daryl is Metis, and he has served 40 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. He, uh, uh, we follow sort of a similar route in some ways. Uh, Daryl has honors degree in physical education, a master's degree in exercise physiology, doctor of medicine, and his CASM diploma in sport medicine. Uh, Daryl represented the CAF at five military world championships, and over his career, he's worked at 24 major games, include, including as a member of the 1980 and 2016 Canadian Paralympic teams and the 2012 Canadian Olympic team. He works, he continues to work as the Surgeon General Specialist advisor in sport medicine and has his own sport medicine practice in, in Russell, Ontario. Some fun facts. Uh, he won a Paralympic gold medal at the 1500 meters with Jacques Pilon in 1980. And this is my favorite. Uh, he was in the 1983 Disney movie, uh, Running Brave. And you can see that arrow. That is our own Daryl Menard. So Daryl, um, woohoo! Let's. Uh, I hand it over to you, Daryl. Great to see you tonight. Thanks. I'm just gonna see if I can share my screen here. Okay, I'll go. Not sure, okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so um, welcome folks. I, I just wanted to start by uh, complimenting Lindsay on her presentation, because if I wasn't a sports medicine physician now, after listening to her talk, I'd be signing up right away. So hopefully I don't do anything to discourage you uh, from what she's already told you about. So. I just want to talk to you briefly about the practice elig eligible route to becoming a jock doc, and I'll explain that as we go along. So this is just working at a, an event. So my story, it, you know, I started off with a Bachelor of Physical Education at the U of A, did my master's in exercise phys then. And when I was doing that, I, I, I began to realize that the things that I enjoyed the most were uh, the athletic injuries part and understanding how the human body worked and anatomy. So I thought, well, you know, uh, maybe I'll go into medicine and I'd like to combine that with sports. And so I, I spent another three years doing medical prerequisites uh, because I didn't have any background in chemistry. And then I finally got accepted at Queens. And then the thing is, I knew when I got accepted to Queens, when I walked in the door that when I was done, I wanted to be a, a sports medicine physician. So it allowed me to orient my training in that direction. So I took, I did orthopedic surgery as my surgical rotations. I did electives in radiology, plastic surgery, sports medicine. I attended as many sports medicine conferences as I could. All of my projects were about sports medicine, you know, in general medicine, I, I gave, you know, presentations on blood doping, you know, rather than the boring things that they were typically talking about. And um, at the same time, 
I had a wife, three children, and I was competing on the military's national running team. So that was a lot of stuff to juggle all at the same time. A after I graduated, I owed the military 10 years of military service. And that's a big chunk of time uh, to owe somebody. And when I graduated, the military did not offer a, uh, anyone in the military the opportunity to do a sports medicine fellowship, as Lindsay was describing. So that door was closed to me for at least 10 years, uh, which was unacceptable to me in terms of you know, trying to achieve my dream. So I began preparing as so I began preparing before I graduated, but I began preparing after graduation to challenge the uh, diploma examination myself. So I, I this is a patient uh, that had a misadventure uh, with anabolic steroids and the scarring is permanent. So I did lots of orthopedic cases in my military practice. I covered as, as Lindsay was saying, a lot of local sports teams, like my children's hockey teams, little Timbits all the way up to covering my sons in junior hockey. And then I did research and uh, wrote a lot of articles on sports related topics and did as much sports medicine as I could within my family practice. Um, I also covered, uh, while I was competing with the military, national and international sports program. I uh, also traveled with them as their doc and I had the opportunity to cover uh, five military world games as their chief medical officer. I did as many CASM and American Academy of Sports Medicine conferences and sports medicine physicians courses as I could to try to prepare. And I studied uh, uh, you know, every sports medicine topic that I could think of. And if when you looked at the program that Lindsay outlined for the residents, you can see how complete that was, like all of the opportunities they have, which I didn't have. And so I had to kind of uh, create on my own as much as I could. So here's another patient in clinic with um, bar fly elbow or olecranon bursitis. So, I challenged the diploma examination in 1994 and was fortunate enough to pass. And this is when I had to make a, a big decision to change my direction in life. So I had to leave April Wine um, as, one of their, um, as one of their members and, and either become a full-time medical practitioner or, uh, or stick with music. So uh, since they were already kicking me out of the group, I, I decided to go into medicine. So. So my recommendations to you, if you are in a similar position to me, or you are one of those people, if there's 19 or 20 uh, residencies and you're not fortunate enough to be able to be, you know, to get one. And Lindsay said something very important, you know, sometimes, you know, luck has a little bit to do with, you know, getting picked for certain things. You just, you're in the right place at the right time. And, you know, you're really well qualified, et cetera, and you just didn't happen to get selected. So I would suggest to you get involved covering local teams and events. It, it doesn't have to be, and I'm not, this is not a put down for Lindsay. She's worked very hard. She's covering, you know, professional teams, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be something you can learn a ton from covering a little peewee hockey team, um, you know, and so get involved at that level and work your way up because you're, you're not going to get to start at the very top, uh, you know, and you, so you have to work your way up. Uh, attend as many CME uh, opportunities as you can. When I first started working with CASM, there really wasn't a lot. There was a, largely the CASM conference, which was excellent, but there weren't this Brichette, like we, we have um, a wonderful banquet of uh, continuing medical education opportunities that CASM currently offers. So get, in, get involved in those and you'll learn a lot. Um, Lindsay also alluded to the fact that in the residency program, you get to work with five or six you know, you know, different clinical groups, like with different sports medicine physicians. <coughs> Excuse me. 
I'd strongly recommend that because you're going to find that one person does this a little bit differently than the other, and you like this particular technique versus the other. So it really expands your horizon. And I'd really recommend um, in your family practices or wherever you end up, try to see as many sports medicine, orthopedic type of patients as you possibly can to build on your experience. Talk to sports medicine fellows about how they're preparing for the diploma exam. Like, what are you studying? What are you doing? You know, what are you, what do you recommend that I have the opportunity uh, to read about? Because they're there, they're preparing for the same stuff you are, and they have uh, maybe a little more, well, a little more guidance than you do from their, their clinical leaders. The CASM website uh, has uh, information for you under resources, uh, go to resident and fellow uh, SME um, resources, and you can find all sorts of information about things that you should know more about. Look at core competencies outlined for the family medicine program and specialists, and you'll see those two um, websites. Uh, if you go to them, they'll actually tell you what they expect a sports medicine physician to be able to understand and to be able to do, which will be very helpful because, you know, what the exam is going to be is a test of you being able to do what people expect you to be able to do. So, you know, my career, how it took, it only took 14 years of hard work, but I have never regretted, and Kathy said that, it's not easy to get to be a sports doc. Uh, I never regretted all the opportunities and the responsibility uh, that my diploma sports medicine uh, status has provided me. And as Lindsay outlined for hers, uh, I'll just go through some of mine. So here are those opportunities. So this is covering finish lines. So I'm a runner. I, I've spent an enormous amount of my career in track and field. And this is covering the, um, the Ottawa race weekend. This is the finish line. Literally, this guy is halfway over it. And he comes in and he looks a little bit out of it, but he, he collapses uh, at the line and he's in ventricular fibrillation. And we actually shock him right on the finish line and we're fortunate enough to bring him back to life. Um, I had an opportunity to travel uh, with the women's under 16 uh, soccer team. Uh, uh, CONCACAF is the, the way to the World Cup. And uh, remarkably, we beat the American team in uh, shootouts after tying them into double overtime. And uh, this is this was just a crazy event, uh, you know, and a crazy moment. It was just so so uh, super to be there as a Canadian and see this happen. So we then go to the World Cup, and I watch the coaching staff overtrain the girls. It worked them way, way, way too hard. And even though I intervened and suggested that this is something that they were doing, um, they, the coach persisted. And this was kind of the way the girls walked onto the field and walked off the field. They were really beaten up uh, for that event. Uh, and they didn't lose any of their games by much. Like it was you know, a one goal game here, but when you're tired and you're this age, and you're playing against the best teams in the world, uh, you may not have the edge that you need to win. So that was a disappointment for them, and it was a disappointment for me. But I, I grew to love these girls as, as you work with them. As Lindsay was saying, they become part of your family. So it was nice to share both events with them. In 2011, I got a short notice call to about six weeks before this event. They didn't have somebody to go, so I went to the Commonwealth Youth Games and got to cover a variety of things, including um, se uh, rugby sevens. It was quite a bit of fun. That was the windiest place in the world I've ever been to because it was it was in the Isle of Man, and I literally got blown off the road running twice. It was just so windy. Uh, as Kathy had mentioned, I'm an Indigenous person, and uh, I want to give back to my uh, indigenous ancestors and, uh, and family. So I have volunteered to cover the 2014 indigenous games and the 2017 indigenous games. 
and the the most recent ones of course were cancelled because of covid so that's very disappointing but this is an event these events are both sports and they are cultural and uh, it's very important look at these two young women you see them in their their uh, traditional regalia they are beautiful young ladies and then you see them in their sports equipment and they're fierce and tough looking and i love this i love this uh poster because it these are proud uh, women proud of their ancestry and proud of being athletes and i love braids i just love uh braids so this is regina and this is the behind the teepee is a, the medical center that we treated uh, the athletes for the Indigenous Games. And we offer, the Games offer traditional medicine as in uh, Indigenous medicine and, uh, you know, regular North American medicine. This is a smudge tent. So um, athletes could see a traditional healer or one of us. And when they came out, they could actually go in and smudge, uh, which is a cleansing uh, ceremony that they can do. Um, at any time they wanted to, before they compete, after they compete, etc. So there was a melding of cultures here, which is very, very important. I love uh, lacrosse. I cover, uh, I cover lacrosse extensively with these guys. This young lady is. These are badges of honor, okay? And I call them ball hickeys. So this is this lady is getting smashed with, uh, with uh, very hard lacrosse balls, but very, very proud. Uh, of these badges of honors. So just to keep this in cultural perspective, some of the kids that come to these events are coming from very remote places. They have never played soccer, but they're on the soccer team because it's a chance to go to this event. And so the very first patient I saw there was a young lady and the note says, it hurts when she kicks the soccer ball with her feet. So I had her take her shoes off and this is what her toenails looked like. So every time she kicked the soccer ball, she was stabbing herself in the toes with her nails. And they were so thick that the only thing that we could do to trim them up was to use a ring cutter, but it worked very well and she was able to play. So again, this is not something that you would see at the Olympics. It's something that you would see doing small town or small time physical, uh, sports medicine, but, um, but it's just as important uh, for this athlete as it would be for someone who was world-class. <laughs> I consider myself very lucky. Uh, as Lindsay had said, you know, one of the goals for many people is a chance to get to go to the Olympics and mine came in 2012. Um, this is a picture of, the, of one of the bridges in London. And this is how I felt when I made the team. So this is the basketball team celebrating in front of the rings. And believe me, that is exactly how I felt when I was selected. I got to work with two medalists. So Antoine came into the, the event as a uh, judo uh, fighter and he was 27th in the world. His first fight was against the reigning Olympic champion, next fight against the reigning world champion, next fight against the Olympic or the world champion bronze medalist. Fourth fight was against the guy that eventually won the gold medal. And here is, here is him coming through Reposage having won the bronze medal. And it was uh, a fantastic moment. The second athlete I worked with was Christine Girard, who was in weightlifting. And this is the night before her competition and as Lindsay said, you, you, it's not all serious work. So <laughs> I didn't have shorts, but I said to, Christine is quite small. And I said, what do you do? And she said, I'm a weightlifter. And I said, ooh, you don't look like a weightlifter, you know? And I, I said, I bet, you know, my legs are bigger than yours. And she said, oh, really? And so she has 60 centimeter thighs and she proved it when we measured her. And I, I came last, I had only 48, but. I had to use my Olympic top as a skirt. Anyway, the next day she comes in, oh, and I bet my biceps are bigger than this old part's thighs, and she was right. The next day she comes out and she won the, the, the fourth place in Beijing. One of the athletes eventually was disqualified. So later on she gets the bronze and she comes and she wins her bronze medal there. 
And so she was very, very happy and I was very happy for her. But I got to meet her six years later and share the ceremony that she had where she got her Olympic gold medal and her Olympic bronze medal awarded to her because uh, the athletes that had beaten her in London were both disqualified for doping. So uh, thank you, uh, Wada. And when I talked to her, I said, do you, do you remember me? And she, in that picture I showed you earlier with us doing the, the quad standoff, she said, oh, I remember you. I have a picture of you and me, me you know, t uh, measuring our quads hanging in my living room. So I thought that was pretty special. The Para Pan Am Games in Toronto 2015 were an amazing event. This is a whole bunch of the, uh, the, the medical team that were there. You can see Don and, and, um, and then our athletes. And this is Corey, my home dog. He was a uh, goaltender with uh, CP and a really cool guy. Got to go to the Rio Games in 2016, uh, working on Copacabana Beach. It's a tough go. One of our athletes having some fun, uh, you know, it turned out that who knew that WD-40 was a, a Paralympic wonder drug. This gentleman, no arms at all. Guess what he plays? Table tennis. And he is world-class. He serves with his feet. And the last thing is uh, the last games I was at were the FISU games in Naples. And uh, we came in and you noticed that we actually had to build our own uh, cupboards out of cardboard boxes because all we got was this table had to buy this thing so sometimes you have to improvise but this thing worked really well for us this is a, a young lady that's now in medical school very early on in rugby she had this injury and needed surgery and we took good care of her young guy i'm trying to you can see he's looking to the finish line he's having hypoglycemia and he went absolutely nuts uh, on the track after that. And that took a little while before the, um, the, the home medical team realized they needed to give him some sugar. And last, this is a guy that this, if this was me, I would have broken my neck. He came out of this with simply a concussion. So my last comments to you are, please get involved. Uh, you are going to definitely enjoy yourself and you just might find your calling in life. Thanks so much, Daryl. And uh, we are going to try to move on quickly because we have one more quick presentation and we do want to take a couple of questions. So the longest we could go would be uh, would be 845, I believe. Um, or sorry, uh, yeah, 845. So I will ask uh, them to start Erica's um, talk. And Erica is a pediatric uh, did her pediatric residency at the University of Alberta and at Stollery Children's Hospital in 2009. She is pediatric sport medicine fellowship at the University of Manitoba previously and holds her diploma in sport and exercise medicine from CASM. She started her sports medicine practice in 2010. She's team physician for several things, but in particular, Skate Canada. She's been part of numerous uh, teams, including the 2018 Winter Olympics in uh, South Korea. She's president-elect of CASM and will take over from me. And a fun fact, she's performed internationally with Royal Caribbean Cruises. And she also taught dance to children and adults She's a bar fitness instructor in her free time. And I'll ask them to start the quick video who cannot be here because she is with uh, one of the, our teams internationally. And she sent a, a video and I believe this is 11 minutes. So uh, we'll have some questions after that. Thank you. Um, but I did want to disclose that I am a national team physician with Skate Canada, which is our national sport organization for figure skating. I am a physician at Vimy Ridge Academy, which is a school here in Edmonton, as well as a physician at Capital City Gymnastics Club here in Edmonton as well. So pediatric sport medicine, people may be thinking, is that even a thing? I get this asked to me actually quite frequently. What is it that you do? Are you a physio? Are you an athletic therapist? Are you a surgeon? Are you a pediatrician? What do you actually do? So um, pediatric sport medicine is a thing. Um, there's just um, a handful of us actually across the country. So it's a kind of a specialty in its infancy. Um, but I did my background, um, which we'll see here in a few slides um, in general pediatrics and then 
and did some extra training afterwards. So pediatric sport medicine is a thing. So within sport medicine, as you, some of you may be aware, um, the pediatric subspecialty is one of the special interest fields. Uh, so we have family physicians, pediatricians, pediatric orthopedics, pediatric emergency physicians, pediatric physiatry, pediatric rheumatology, all of which see children and adolescents that are active in sport and regular physical activity. They assess and treat all of these active children and youth. However, we've got a number of pediatric specific sport and exercise medicine fellowship programs, mostly in the States, but there are um, a few Canadian based ones. So we are seeing an increasing number of pediatric uh, specific sport and exercise medicine uh, specialists within Canada, which is really exciting because I think we have a lot to offer our youth um, as we are taught in our pediatrics rotations. Kids are not just little adults and if we can take the vice versa, adults are not just big kids. So how did I get here? Um, I did my medical school at the University of Alberta. I was quite interested in anatomy during my undergraduate years. Um, then it came to clerkship and I thoroughly loved my pediatrics rotations. Um, and after graduating medical school, I really thought I was going to be doing um, pediatric oncology as I had an awesome experience with some wonderful mentors and physicians during my fourth year. Um, so I decided to apply for pediatrics um, during the residency match and was successfully matched at the University of Alberta, Stollard Children's Hospital. And during this rotation or during my four year fellowship, I was really drawn to adolescent aged patients. And at this point, I kind of was thinking, oh, am I going to still do oncology or do I want to really work with teenagers specifically? So I did um, really work a little bit more in delving into adolescent medicine. And at that time, it was still in its infancy as well. Um, and then it happened. I had a chance discussion with a fellow pediatrics resident in my program, and she was from Winnipeg. And she mentioned to me that there is a pediatric physician in Winnipeg that works at the Children's Hospital in Winnipeg, but also works at the Royal Winnipeg Ballet School. And this kind of just piqued my interest because my sport background was dance. I grew up dancing competitively. I was a part of a few dance companies growing up. And then I ran a dance company for kids um, during my undergraduate um, university years and I thought oh my goodness is there a way to combine my two kind of loves working with dancers as well as medicine so I contacted this physician in Winnipeg um, Dr. Zederuk uh, Marilee and she was fantastic so I completed a one-month elective with her at the at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg and I loved it so much that I actually just sort of gave up my aspirations of doing adolescent medicine and said I want to do pediatric sport medicine it was just the great fit between my two loves and combining them together so after I did that elective Marilee and I chatted a little bit more and she actually was in the process of creating a fellowship program um, based on some of the rural college at areas of focused competency and sort of the diploma programs that were just being thought about at that point. So she based my one year training and my one year fellowship program on these competencies. Um, so I was able to have both clinical experiences and on field experiences so that I would be eligible to sit the CASM diploma exam. So I did sit that exam at the end of my fellowship year and was thankfully successful and then um, became a pediatric sport medicine uh, physician. So how do you get to sport and exercise medicine from the rural college or from the specialty medicine perspective? Um, have to complete your residency first, your primary residency first. So this is not a direct for medical school entry, um, either emergency uh, medicine, pediatrics, physiatry, orthopedics, internal medicine um, needs to be done prior to your um, fellowship applications. Then need to apply to the fellowship program. In Canada, 99% of the programs are adult based with some pediatric exposure. Um, but in the US, there are both adult and pediatric based programs. So depending on your own individual situation, um, something to look into. I know a number of uh, pediatric sport medicine doctors here in Canada have completed United States fellowships. And I would say the same thing for some of the orthopedic surgeons, physiatrists that are working in sport medicine here in Canada um, have also gone down to the States to complete their fellowships as well and then have come back. 
Um, I mentioned earlier the Royal College area of focus competency, so the AFC or otherwise known as the diploma. Um, this is currently in process of accrediting individual training programs and the practice eligible route is still in the works. So keep your eyes out on the Royal College website if this is something that is of interest to you and you're thinking you're going to be going the specialty medicine route, um, because there will definitely be um, new things coming up to get even more letters behind your name. <laughs> So after fellowship, AKA real life. So what is, what kind of happened after I finished my fellowship? Um, given the fact that a lot of people didn't have any idea what sport medicine was and then put pediatric in front of it, it was even more confusing. I spent a significant amount of my time educating colleagues and healthcare organizations about what I do. This was the, probably the most challenging thing to start with um, because I remember coming back after my fellowship back to Edmonton and meeting with the chair of our pediatrics department and they were saying well not quite sure what you do but we have a position in the NICU um, would you want to do that and that was kind of the first realization that okay this is going to be an uphill climb educating what sport medicine is so thankfully I think things have changed in the last decade but um, it definitely um, persistence was uh, key in making this transition for me quite successful next thing I, I kind of wanted to make sure I was joining a group of like-minded healthcare professionals including physicians and non-physicians so our multidisciplinary teams this is creating your network you have to kind of figure out for yourself what type of environment do you like working in? Do you like working in the hospital? Do you like having that academic role? Do you want to be part of a academic department, having those research, teaching, um, and clinical responsibilities? Or are you one that more really likes to get down and dirty within the community and, and sort of that grassroots and being available to your patients to provide that regular clinical care um, and finding people who are like-minded with yourself. Um, I think that's the, the best thing to, to look for when trying to plan a successful sort of post-fellowship career. The other thing in sport medicine particularly is connecting with um, various organizations. And for me, it was various youth sports organizations, both locally and provincially teams and clubs and what you're and what I was trying to achieve was um, bringing out the message that sport medicine can enhance the athlete health and safety and in pediatrics for the kids who are participating here it was the challenge of getting my foot in the door and creating those trusting relationships um, with coaches with um, team uh, leaders team organizations um, and really using that relationship um, building to uh, reach a common goal to enhance the athlete health and performance um, you may realize that um, sometimes when working with individual um, organizations and, and clubs and teams they're just scared that you're going to take all their athletes out until they can't play. Um, so it was a little bit of an uphill battle that way too, to kind of create those relationships. But once that was done and everybody realized we all have the same end goal, um, it was actually quite successful. So I just wanted to kind of maybe switch gears here a little bit and tell you about what is a week in my life. <laughs> so um, as a community-based uh, physician, I work on Monday afternoons out of a community clinic. And here in Alberta, I'm out of a physiotherapy clinic, which is not super common. So I think that's where a lot of the confusion when people come to see me, they're wondering what kind of provider I am. Um, but in other places in the country, I think there are more um, physicians working out of multidisciplinary and allied health clinics, including physiotherapy clinics. Clinics. Um, Tuesday, I have my kind of home-based clinic where I do patient consults and follow-up visits. Wednesday, I'm out into the community at a local gymnastics club where I'm working there um, twice a month. Um, Thursdays, I actually work at a school that's here in the city. Um, junior and senior high school um, has about a thousand athletes and they all have to be part of a sport program to attend this school so this has been a great thing I've been doing for the last kind of six years and it gets me into the school directly into the um, uh, access uh, for the student athletes so they don't have to miss either academic time or their training time within their sport and I can see them at the school directly and then back on to Fridays I'm back to my home base clinic for again consults and follow-ups um, People may be asking, okay, well, how are you funded? What do you, how do you, how do you get paid? 
Um, I am fee for service. Um, I am not alternative relationship or salaried. Um, I know uh, there are various models there, but for me, it's it's I'm all fee for service. And I found for me that that works, um, especially at this point in time. Um, but as lots of things in medicine are, is evolving. So kind of keeping um, options open as well. Um, other things I may be doing, maybe not on a weekly basis, but in my year, um, field and event coverage, um, and it all depends on what events are being held and what the season is. Um, mostly I'm volunteering, but often will receive, we'll receive an honoraria or my travel being paid for. And I volunteer both at local events, national events and international events too. And it's a great way to kind of get out uh, in interacting with athletes in their environments of competition and also um, interacting with other healthcare professionals, which I found has been really, really fun. Um, I do do some academic work. I am an associate clinical professor in pediatrics and family medicine here at the University of Alberta. Um, and I preceptor and teach clinically uh, medical students, residents, and fellows. Um, and I'm also a committee member for our undergraduate medical education program in their MSK block that happens in second year. And I'm the chair of our pediatric week, um, which is a, uh, one of the six weeks in their pediatric or in their MSK block. Um, so providing some perspective on sport medicine as well as pediatric MSK issues. Um, national organization work. I am currently the president elect for CASM. So we'll be starting my presidential year uh, next summer and have been a board of directors member for the last number of years as well. And it's been a wonderful organization to work with and work for. And I'm looking forward to what's coming ahead in the next years. So I think just like to close with some final thoughts. Um, in a way, I felt like a little bit of a trailblazer. Um, a lot of people hadn't known what I've done or what I'm doing. And People said, oh, well, you can't do that or you can't do this. And um, I would just give you the advice is don't be afraid to make your own way. Um, if you're passionate about it and you've got some creativity and where there's a will, there's a way, um, you can be that trailblazer. Um, so I think another thing would be to create a work environment that brings you joy and fulfillment. Um, especially after this COVID or during COVID right now, a lot of us have reflected on our current practices and um, what we want out of practice. And I think it's so important that we are working in an environment that brings you joy and fulfillment. Um, next thing is it's okay to change your mind. Um, I changed my mind many times <laughs> throughout medical school and then residency and I finally found something that really is what I want. Um, so it's okay to do some of the mind changing. Um, and then probably finally um, would be don't lose sight of why you wanted to become an, a physician in uh, the first place. Be true to your own compass. Um, so just kind of listen to that inner voice, um, that direction and be true to that. So on that note, I am going to let you guys um, go and um, leave the questions for the Q&A. And I think um, I will be able to answer some of those questions at the uh, after the session is finished. And we'll get back to you guys if you have questions. So thanks very much for having me and have a wonderful night. That's great. Uh, that's super. Thank you uh, so much to all of you and good luck, uh, Erica. I think she's off. I uh, can't even remember which uh, which country she's in. Don, do you know where she is? She's uh, covering a skate Canada event. I think here in Canada, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, and thank you so much, Daryl and Lindsay. And I know time is short. It, we, uh, I'm sure that the, uh, the four of us are able to keep going here, um, but I'm gonna to try to answer as many questions, we will, uh, as many questions as possible. I think this is also being recorded and the answers will be recorded. So if some of you do have to go, uh, they will uh, send out the uh, recordings if I'm not mistaken there. Uh, so let's get going through a few questions here. Uh, one of them uh, was from, looks like Linz, and uh, I'm gonna ask Lindsay to, uh, uh, no, it was Ryan Kirby, sorry. And he is asking, I'm curious how competitive the PGY3 programs are particularly in Ontario. That's a good question. And it, it does change from year to year, the number of applicants that we have. Um, it does fluctuate based on, you know, who's, who's interested. Um, as an example, just this past year at the University of Ottawa, we um, had 14 applicants and we do have two spots. 
yet many of those applicants are also applying to multiple programs. So, um, you know, that's, like I said, there's 19 to 20 spots across the country. So those 14 applicants were from Ontario uh, and East Coast and West Coast. So, um, and not everybody applies to every program, obviously, but um, so it's hard for me to say exactly, like, you know, how many of those people wouldn't get a spot anywhere. Um, but I would say, you know, it depends year to year, but the vast majority of residents that are interested and, and have done, um, you know, some, some legwork in, in showing that they're interested in that, um, will often get a spot somewhere. Um, the PGA3, it does go through CARMS, uh, meaning so it is sort of a rank list system and you get matched to a program. So um, often you're able to, to, to match somewhere, even if it's not uh, your first choice program. Thanks very much. And I'm going to jump to Daryl here uh, and uh, ask him from Pavlo uh, Zerbecki. Uh, does the scope of practice of a sports medicine physician vary depending on whether you are primarily a family physician, physiatrist, orthopedic surgeon, emergency physician, et cetera? Yeah, thanks for the question. <clears throat> I actually think the scope of practice uh, for sports medicine physicians varies considerably for the individual. As you could see from Lindsay's presentation, she does, she does primarily sports medicine now and works with a lot of teams and she's working primarily with university-based athletes. I work in a farming community where I see a tremendous amount of osteoarthritis uh, in terms of pain management for those people. And if you look at, at Erica, she does primarily her work with pediatrics and does a lot of traveling. You meet other sports medicine physicians who work entirely in academic settings where they are doing, some of them are working for the Canadian Medical Protective Association and using their expertise in that way. I also spend a lot of time working for the Surgeon General trying to convince the Army to change its uh, approach to training soldiers so that we reduce the injuries. We're literally wiping our Army out by injuring them doing things. And that takes, that's not so much clinical medicine, it's, it's actually gaining the trust of the army, which is very difficult to do and trying to convince them to uh, put in strategies that will help them be bent more successful. So we have Andy Marshall, you saw a few pictures of an orthopedic surgeon, you know, he's, he's an orthopedic surgeon, he doesn't really do pediatrics, but he does a lot of adult uh, uh, sports medicine, he spends a lot of time working on educational programs, etc. So I think when you when you listen to Kathy, Lindsay, Erica, and myself, what they were trying to say to you is you can really make your sports medicine career whatever you want it to be. It's a, a huge uh, area of opportunity. And if you have the courage to go your own route, uh, you can pretty much do whatever you like. Uh, I had, thank you for that, Daryl. Sorry, Lindsay. I was just going to add quickly to that, that your, your day-to-day -day work and your specialty will be a little bit different, but then your teamwork, if you do team type stuff is going to be the same. So, um, you know, like you said, the orthopedic surgeon is going to do orthopedic clinic and we're going to do sport medicine clinic. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, when we both show up to, to cover a team, the orthopedic surgeon still got to prescribe an antibiotic for, for a medical illness, um, or I'm still going to have to manage a fracture. On the, on the sideline if I'm the only one there. So um, there are some, you know, overlap and crossover for sure, depending on the setting you're in. And also your career evolves through your lifetime as well. Like you may do a ton of travel at one point and then you have some family commitments and it's a little more difficult and, and you may choose other areas. Uh, and so there's lots of areas, which is great. I'm gonna ask Dawn to speak to this. A test Bracken asked uh, if we would mind going briefly over the CASM committees that are available to medical students. Sure, and I've just put a note in the chat with my email in. So uh, we do have um, some standing committees, but more specifically, I think for medical students, um, we have a special interest groups. So we have endurance sport medicine. We have the adaptive uh, group that Lindsay, Dr. Bradley chairs, uh, we have a new uh, special interest group of athlete mental health. And again, 
um, getting that medical student perspective would be uh, invaluable. Standing committees, we have communications where we create podcasts, we create the newsletter, we create um, web content, again, where your input as a medical student would be invaluable and we would like you on the committee. The national educational strategy, um, you know, your, your help uh, and your input on that um, overall committee would be, um, you know, valuable too. So there are lots of different um, committees. The committee structure is up on the CASM website. I put my email in the chat. Give me a call. It doesn't have to be, uh, it could just be a, an interest email and I can, um, you know, send, uh, send some possible uh, links to you and you can see if you're interested or not. Uh, no commitment. You can just, uh, just send me an email. Excellent. Um, and you'll see that we're all very available. Uh, send us all emails. I mean, we will respond and we're always happy to help. And that's part of being a sports medicine physician. So um, we're, always, uh, we're always very helpful. Uh, as the PG, uh, Rebecca Fournier says, as a PGY1 in the Maritimes, I find myself in an area with few CASM physicians. Do you have any advice regarding how to seek out more field side experience in this context? Should I approach local athletic therapy team? Uh, want the experience, but obviously want to stay safe and ethical. And this is a great, uh, I'll speak first and then let my colleagues uh, respond. First, you have to know uh, if you are in the, uh, in the Maritimes, um, one of your CASM physicians there in Halifax, actually in Dartmouth, Tina Atkinson just won, uh, just was awarded the uh, Canadian Community uh, Physician of the Year. And uh, I actually just saw her here. She's with the national hockey team and they had just come back from Finland and she contacted me with a player that needed an X-ray uh, repeat of her ankle. And I slipped her into the clinic in Toronto here. And that's the kind of thing that we do for each other. Uh, so there are certainly physicians in the Maritimes that are CASM physicians. And you can get a list of those from, from our CASM site or, or through Dawn. Um, the, uh, the easiest way is to contact one of them or to contact the university teams. Uh, I did my undergrad at Dell and I know the athletic, uh, um, director there, uh, Tim Maloney, um, uh, I've spoken to him about their team positions and they're often, there's often ways of volunteering with, uh, one of the team physicians, just to get your feet wet in that regard. I don't know if Daryl or Lindsay have anything to add uh, to that off the top of their head. Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, that there's always local events too, that even if it's not a chasm physician, it might be an eMERGE physician or something like that at marathons and stuff like that, that Daryl was talking about. There's always events that, that provide lots of learning. Um, and if you do work with a, a local PT or AT, that's totally fine. I think as long as you're up front with them saying that if you're there as a resident, you would really be there as first aid coverage rather than acting as a physician. And so that's fine. You can go and be a first aider, which if you have your CPR and your, and your first aid up to date, um, you can go there as that rather than going underneath your educational license. You don't have to have a, a doctor as a supervisor. So you know, that's a nice way to be on the sidelines of events and, and see different things, but know that you're not working outside of your scope and that you'd really only be working in a first aid capacity. Just one other thing, uh, that's great advice. But one thing is you don't need your dip sport med either to uh, volunteer for the Canada Games. And uh, so that is one thought and you get so much experience and working with, with, with other physicians there. Plus we have a very rich CPD program and we have sideline courses and we have excellent uh, courses. We have some coming up at our annual meeting, which is in Quebec in April. And uh, I see some of my mentees on this uh, call and uh, I've been trying to get, get them to sign up for that as well. And uh, so there's lots of those kinds of opportunities to get your feet wet as well. And through those you meet uh, lots of uh, sports medicine colleagues and they will, believe me, they will recruit you <laughs> to help out. Um, so any other comments, Daryl? You're on mute there. No, I, I think Lindsay, Lindsay said it all. You know, again, be involved, but stay within your scope of practice and uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot. And 
like Kathy said, if you can latch on to uh, a, a team physician somewhere that's working, even do it as a, you know, travel, you know, travel to be with them. Some people travel a couple of hours on the weekends and they do this sort of stuff, but start building up your resume and get some experience. Uh, Jason Esu says, could anyone provide an opinion on the merits of the IOC diploma in sport medicine versus the CASM diploma in sport medicine? Um, I do know that you need the CASM diploma in sports medicine if you go to Olympics with our teams or travel with our uh, uh, international traveling teams. Uh, but anyone else want to comment on the, the IOC diploma? It's certainly a different uh, a different type of exam. Yeah, I don't know much about it. I think they, I think it's a lot of virtual stuff now, like module based and things like that. And you get a little certificate at the end, but I would say from a Canadian context of wanting to work with teams that the, the CASM diploma, um, studying for that and getting your exam is, um, is kind of, you know, our standard here in Canada, particularly for many national sporting organizations, even if you're not going to Olympics or Paralympics, you know, they'll look uh, for you to have that chasm sort of, you know, stamp that shows that you've, you've met these competencies and you've been able to pass that, um, you know, and as well, if you're looking for that certificate of added competence from a practice eligible route in the Royal College or the family medicine, um, they'll often, you know, they, it's not, it's not a guarantee, but it, it, they'll often use having the CASM diploma as an equivalency of, of reaching competence. Mm -hmm. yeah, and just to add, actually, for any uh, games, so any games our franchise holders uh, would um, like the, we actually CASM do the call for applications and you need the diploma in sport medicine. The exception is Canada games, which are developmental games, which you don't need your diploma for, and the Jeux de la Francophonie. Um, which uh, which they happen every once every four years, but every other games that Canada hosts and every uh, uh, sorry that Canada attends and every national sport organization requires the dip sport med. So um, I think the IOC diploma is a nice to have and would give you a broader. You could it's a nice broad study for the diploma. Um, it's also uh, as I say it's virtual and it's modular and I I believe the the, the only site in Canada is Calgary to sit the exam. And the other thing is it's a great exam. It really is very practical. And uh, if, you, if you can pass the diploma exam, you can pretty much manage most situations. It's very practical with the OSCE component for sure. So Steph Delaire says, I'm interested in the practical practice eligible stream and just wondering your opinion on whether sports medicine clinics would be open and interested in having a veteran GP do some uh, shadowing fellow like work in their clinics. Um, I can take uh, it up. Daryl. So um, great question. And uh, almost certainly uh, you will find that um, those clinics will be welcoming to you, especially when they find out that you're interested in this and either looking at this as a potential career or, uh, you know, trying to see if this actually works for you. Um, I know in my own clinic, we have hosted medical students and residents, and I, we do do an outreach thing where we go out and teach uh, family physicians, um, sports medicine uh, skills. I'm getting ready to uh, retire from uh, care. And so I want some of the physicians around me to know a little bit more so they can take care of the community that I live in and love. And uh, so we have to pass that on. Yep. Great. And we have um, Dr. David uh, Levy with us from McMaster and a well-known uh, sports medicine physician. And he is uh, commenting here, we presently have a PGY-5 ER sport med fellow at McMaster. As a result of competency-based programs, he successfully wrote his ER Royal College exam in fourth year and is doing a full year of sport med in our program this year as his PGY-5 option. He is a Queen's ER resident in uh, ER. So if you do have questions around that, contact uh, David at McMaster. I, I, uh, he's a well-known sports medicine uh, 
CASM uh, member and physician. Um, and uh, I might just sorry, add, I just, yeah, I might just add to that because I think that that was in Dr. Levy's response to somebody's question about um, going the, the ER route. So um, I think with some programs going, having their, their interest year being six months versus a year, that might be something we'll have to discuss at our post-grad education committee, because can you get all of the one year's competencies in that six months? Um, it will depend program to program. So because this is a new question that's going to be asked, it will be something we'll have to discuss at our group and at CASM, whether or not you'd be able to sit the exam with a six month fellowship versus uh, a year. Um, or whether or not you'd have to wait and, and go the practice eligible route. But um, I didn't realize that there were many programs going down to a six month for their special interest year. So um, I can take that back and uh, we'll, um, uh, I'll just note your name there, uh, Sean, and we'll maybe get back to you with a, a more solidified answer from our post-grad education committee. And uh, perhaps we'll take one last question. I know everyone has been very patient uh, but let's do this last one because we're almost at nine o'clock. And uh, again, we're happy to stay on, I'm sure, but uh, I think we should call it, a, a call it a night. So Matt He says, as a PGY2 in family medicine, I did not realize I'm very interested in sports medicine until after the plus one deadline. If I were to complete the CASM diploma without the enhanced skills program, would it have limitations on job opportunities in the future? Uh, why don't, uh, uh, Lindsay, why don't, would you like to tackle that one there? Yeah, sure. I mean, it really is going to depend, I think, um, on where you're applying, whether or not they'll want you to have had that extra year of training or whether or not, you know, doing the diploma, you know, would be would be su sufficient. If you're doing the diploma outside of, of a fellowship trained program or a PGY3, um, then you do have to be in practice for a while before you're able to challenge that exam. So you'll have to have some practical experience, um, you know, in order to do that. So you wouldn't be able to you know, going to a clinic and saying, I'd like to get a sport medicine job on, on day one outside of PGY2, if you haven't done that fellowship, that might be challenging. But um, like Daryl said, you can work with somebody, work a day a week, you get some experience, you get some exposure, then you challenge your exam later, and then you might be able to change your scope um, uh, later on. Um, so it really would depend where you're, where you're wanting to work. The one thing that depending on the province, it might affect your billing, so for example, in Ontario, if you have a PGY3 fellowship, um, it's much easier to get what's called a focus practice designation, um, which then means that uh, billing is a little bit different. Uh, so again, that's province to province specific. So you'd probably have to ask um, a sport medicine physician in your, if you're not in Ontario in your province to find out how that might affect billing if you were, if you were to do things not through um, the fellowship route. Um, unfortunately, I agree. The plus one deadline is very early. We would love to change that later. Um, it does have to do because we nationally all have to be the same. Uh, and for, for, for Quebec, that deadline needs to be a little bit earlier in order for people to get jobs if they don't get a fellowship. Um, but that is something we are discussing because it's true. There are many people uh, in your situation, uh, Matt, that kind of, you know, find out later that love, right? You don't have electives till later on and, and, and those applications are due quite early in your PGY too. So um, yeah, we do acknowledge that is a little bit of an issue. Okay. Thank you very much again. Uh, thanks to Lindsay, to Daryl, to Erica. Great presentations, and we could sit here all night and listen to some of your uh, your stories, uh, Daryl, about uh, uh, and watch many more pictures there. Um, also, wanted to thank the office staff, Helen and Rebecca, and our ex uh, executive director extraordinaire, uh, Don Howarth. They're always there. They're always helpful. And uh, so if you have any further questions, we're certainly available and we're happy to uh, um, take any uh, questions, emails and so forth, just uh, contact the CASM office. Have a great night. Thank you for uh, tuning in today and uh, all the best with your careers. And uh, we hope to see you in Quebec at the CASM meeting. Have a great Thank night. You.
Thank you Good very night. much. Good luck, everybody. Good night. Good night.